Good morning. I'm sure I'll have all of y'all's attention as they bring that food out, you know. I just want to remind you, it just came to me. Oh, by the way, no children's church today, uh, abbreviated service. Um, so we're all just going to hang out together. Um, If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to John, and uh, we're going to be focusing on one verse, John 3.16. Most of us probably know it, some of us by heart, uh, but we're going to look at that today as we look at the subject of the greatest love of all. Uh, when I was lost, I, uh, not that I couldn't... Uh, George Benson is a jazz guitarist, and, and uh, he sang a song called The Greatest Love of All, and I really, I was lost, I was in the military at the time, I really liked the song, I just thought it was a cool song, I thought he played it well. Uh, most of you don't even know who George Benson is, do you? Right. How many of you can raise your hand and tell me who George Benson is? About four people, okay. <clears throat> you will know this song better by Whitney Houston, who also sang it. Now, how many of y'all know who Whitney Houston is? Everybody, Okay. Listen to the words of this song. It's entitled, The Greatest Love of All. You ready? And it goes this way. I hope I don't break out in song in it. Um, <laughs> in my head, I'm already, I believe. Uh, here, here's the lyrics. I believe the children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Give them a sense of pride to make it easier. Let the children's laughter remind us how we used to be. Everybody's searching for a hero. People need someone to look up to. I never found anyone who fulfilled my needs, a lonely place to be, and so I learned to depend on me. I, I decided long ago never to walk in anyone's shadows. If I fail, if I succeed, at least I'll live as I believe. No matter what they take from me, they can't take away my dignity. Because the greatest love of all is happening to me, I found the greatest love of all inside of me. The greatest love of all is easy to achieve. Learning to love yourself, it is the greatest love of all. That is the world's understanding of the greatest love. It's something you can possess on the inside of you uh, if you just reach down in there and discover it. But I would disagree with Whitney and George and whoever wrote the lyrics to this song that the greatest love of all isn't something that you conjure up on the inside of you. The greatest love of all is something you experience when God introduces himself to you. Amen. Right? The greatest love of all. I, uh, I grew up in a broken home, and I uh, didn't experience much love at all. Uh, at, at all. Um... And I never really understood any kind of love until I met my wife on a college campus. And I fell head over heels madly in love with her. And the first time I ever told her I loved her was, I, I'm not a Spanish uh, expert, but I had asked someone, how do you say I love you in Spanish? And I think it's te amo. You Spanish people, am I right? So we were sitting in the cafeteria, I think, and I, I told her as she was getting ready to leave, go to class, whatever, I said, oh, hey, uh, I just want you to know Te Amo. And she, what's that mean? I said, you have to go figure it out. <laughs> really, that's how it went down, right, baby? And she had to go ask someone, what on earth does Te Amo mean? And then they told her it means I love you. And I wish I could have been there to see her face to know that I had expressed for the first time that I actually was in love with her. That was great, but what was greater is when she said she loved me back. You, know, you take a risk, right? I love you, pause. <laughs> but she said she loved me back. And, um, and I was thinking this week about our kids when they were born, how magical it is to 
hold that brand new baby in your arms and, and that, that overwhelming sense of love that you have for this brand new human being that you're holding in your arms for the first time. And, and just, you just, I, I don't know about you, but I know it was, it, it was an awesome love. But all of those loves that I've experienced now with Trudy, my kids, the love I have for you, the love you guys share with me, it pales in comparison to the love of God. Amen. There is no love like God's love Amen. that he has for those that he calls. And first, in fact, 1 John 4, 7 through 10 says it like this. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. The, who's the him there? Jesus. In this, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And so John is writing and describing uh, love. And he's saying, listen, if, you, if, if the agape love of God is in you, uh, you will love each other. If, if you don't love each other, it's, it's proof positive that the agape love of God is not in you. Love is a, a, a critical mark of a believer. Well, why is that? In 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, Paul writes this, now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Let me read that again. Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you. Paul's saying no one even needs to write to you about this. No one needs to explain it. Why? For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. God loved, God's love is so important that he himself is the one that not only teaches us about love, he's the one that gives us love. Romans 5.5 5 says this, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So God takes his love, and at the foot of the cross, when we say yes to Jesus, and we repent, and turn to Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, and his sacrificial death and his resurrection, it's right there that God just pours his love, his agape love, into our lives. And from that point on, the mark of a believer is not only that we love God and that God loves us, but that we love one another. And it doesn't matter our backgrounds. You know, you've heard me say a million times, yellow, red, black, and white, and whatever other colors out there. It doesn't, God loves us. And we ought to love one another. The church should be full of love. Whose love? God's love. As we walk this walk. And it's the love that we show each other, friends, that ought to make the world desperate to come because they see a love that the world doesn't have. Our, our human love is predicated on, on the person that we're, the object of our love behaving a certain way, right? That's why we have so much divorce in, 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 in our world because the minute our spouse does things we don't like, we just get rid of them. We have a disposable love, but that's not how God loves God's love is unconditional, and once you have it, he never takes it back. Think about that. Think about your worst day as a Christian. Why others might reject you, God never will. Isn't that amazing? I've had bad days as Christians. I've had bad days. I don't know about you, if you can admit that to yourself, but I've done things, even as a Christian, that I'm ashamed of and that, that the world might reject me. Maybe the church would reject me, but God never does. And so we're going to look at John three sixteen, 
And we're going to see three things about the greatest love of all, God's love. The first thing we're going to notice is that discovering God's love is the key to salvation. Discovering God's love is the key to salvation. The second thing, walking in God's love is the key to serving. Walking in God's love is the key to serving. And then third, understanding God's love is the key to security. So let's go through that. Discovering God's love is the key to salvation. Walking in God's love is the key to service. And understanding God's love is the key to security. So let's look at John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, who's the him? Jesus Christ, shall not perish but have, have eternal life. This one verse is referenced as the gem of the gospel. In this one verse, you have the gospel message. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And when you think of God giving, it's not just that he gave him to you and I, but he gave him by, through the cross to you and I. God loved you so much that he was willing to send his only begotten son to this earth so that he might live a sinless life and die a sacrificial death for you and I. Jesus willingly came to this earth to do such a thing as that. So two things about John 3, 16 I want us to see. Number one, the declaration of God's love. The declaration, for God so loved the world. That's a declaration of God's love. Now, the world he's talking about is not the globe. It's not uh, earth, it, 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 though he has created it. The love that J Jesus is talking about in John 3, 16 of the world is people. And when I witness to people, a lot of times I'll say something like this, for God so loved Tammy, for God so loved Jim, for God so lived, loved Trudy, for God so lived uh, Lynetta, for God so loved Brian. And because I want them to understand while God loves the world, he loves us as individuals. If you're here today and you've never experienced the love of God and you maybe are sitting here thinking, man, even if there is a God and even if he loves, there's no way he could love me if he knew who I was. That's not true. That's a lie of the enemy. He doesn't want you to come to God. He doesn't want you to understand the greatest love of all. He doesn't want you to get that. Listen, I want you to know something about the declaration of, this, uh, of love of when God declares it. Look at Romans 5, 8 and 9. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Who's the him? Jesus Christ. Amen. While we were yet sinners, God demonstrated his love. Most of us only love people at their best, and we want to get rid of them at their worst. Well, that's not how God loves you. God loves you at your very worst. While we were yet sinners. And listen, friend, if one sin kept Moses out of the promised land, amen? One sin. He struck a rock when God said, speak to it, and he didn't get to take the people into the promised land. I want us to not diminish the reality that sin is ugly and God hates sin. He hates it. And yet here we have Paul telling us in Romans 5, that in spite of the fact that God hates sin, and he does, in fact, his wrath abides on all of us who are outside of the family of God, and he's going to judge this world at the end, and those who have rejected Christ are going to be cast into the lake of fire. That's all true. And yet, at your very worst, God wants you to know he loves you. I remember when I was in that apartment in Evansville, Indiana, I was lost. I was homeless. I wasn't sure whether I wanted to live anymore. I had lost everything. My family had disowned me. And, and I, I was sitting there contemplating whether to go on living when God spoke to my heart and told me, don't do that, Jim. I love you. I love you as you are, but I love you enough not to let you stay that way. 
And I surrendered my life to Christ that day. And I have felt and experienced the love of God every single day since. Have I sinned? Yes. Have I been ashamed of some of my actions? Yes. Do I wonder how on earth God can still love me sometimes? Yes. But I have the promises of God's word. Amen. Amen. And we know that God's love is permanent on those that surrender their life to Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 5 tells us that he, I love how it said he pours his love in us, Tammy. Like when you said yes to Jesus, it's as if he unscrewed your head and dumped into your body his love. And if you're really born again, you know what I'm talking about. I went from using people and abusing people and manipulating people to when I said yes to Jesus, all of a sudden I had a, I had a newfound love for humanity Amen. of all races, of all sizes, of all colors, of all ethnicities, of all types because God gave it to me. And I experienced his love that day in that apartment in Evansville and I he declared his love for me through his son, Jesus Christ. And when he declared it, I, I, I understood that he not only declared his love, but he demonstrated his love. Listen, words are cheap. Would you agree with that? Words are cheap. I pray none of you are in a loveless marriage. I hope that's the case. But if all I ever did was tell Trudy I loved her and never backed it up with action... What good is that? At some point, she's going to say, I don't want to hear it, right? At some point, she's going to say, you don't love me. Oh, yes, I do. No, you don't, because I don't see anything in your life that backs up that claim. I use a phrase all the time in my personal life and from the pulpit, and it's this. Love is only known by the action it promotes. Well, if you don't take anything else with you, take that with you. Love is only known by the action it promotes. There has to be some substance behind the words. Like it wasn't enough that I told Trudy I loved her, Te amo. It wasn't enough that I said it. I had to back up my words with actions. That's what God did. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. In John 10, 14 through 18... We read the following words that Jesus spoke. John 10, 14 through 18 says this. I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own knows me. And even as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. Listen, if, if you wonder if God loves you, if there's any substance to the claim, look to the cross. That's the proof of God's love. When I'm doubting things, when I'm in a rough patch in my life and I'm starting to question stuff in my humanity and does anyone care, what's going on? And, and, and when I think of whether or not God loves me in spite of myself, all I have to do is look to the cross. The cross is proof of his love. For God so loved the world that he gave. That's a big word gave there. Because the giving that is talking about is that his son would leave glory, come to earth, live a sinless life, and die a sacrificial death. If you wonder if God can love you, just look to the cross. You've seen the pictures. How much does Jesus love you? And he's got his arms outstretched with the nails in them this much. He loves you this much. The cross is proof that there's substance behind the claim that God loves us. He absolutely loves us. It is the key to salvation, discovering God's love. But I want you to see something else. Walking in God's love is the key to serving. Walking in God's love. Now, you know the, the scripture I'm about to give you because I use it quite often because it's such a powerful demonstration of how once we've experienced the love of God, once Romans 5, 5 has happened and he has shed abroad in our hearts his love, 
then this ought to be true too. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. When Paul writes, for the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, sort of Paul's bottom line, that one died for all and therefore all died. Did you notice how, what he tied with the love of Christ, the demonstration, what did he do? Look at the end of that verse, that one died for all. He's talking about the cross. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, who's the he? And he died for all so that they who live. Now what living is he talking about? He's not talking about earthly living. He's talking about those who are spiritually alive. Everyone's alive physically. The lost and the saved. So we know Paul's not talking about that. Notice what he says in verse 15. And he died for all so that they who live spiritually might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. MacArthur says of, of Paul's choice there in 14, for the love of Christ controls us. And here's MacArthur's quote. It was that magnanimous, free, unmerited love that controlled, drove, and motivated Paul. I honestly believe that once you've truly experienced God's love, once you realize you can walk in that love every day of your life, it's the key to serving him. Once you really realize how much God loves you and what Jesus did for you, it ought to radically change your approach to this thing called human life. Paul says that all of us who have been rescued by God's love through the sacrificial death of Christ, we ought to be motivated by a heart of gratitude, as Paul puts it. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves. Wow. I mean, if I were to be real with you today, that's not true of me every day. Sometimes I take the steering wheel back from G. Amen. Sometimes I have a day where I just want to do what Jim wants to do. But friends, let me tell you something. If you've experienced the greatest love of all, the love of God through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are, you are born again, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, your life ought to reflect that reality that we would no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again for us. We would no longer live for ourselves. How important is it that we understand that? That we who have been saved, sanctified, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, who's had the love of God shed abroad in our hearts once we said yes to Jesus, why is it that so many are not living for him who claim the title of son of God, child of God, the beloved of God? Why are we still so centered on self rather than him? It's like we need a refresher every day of what he did for us, right? We ought to keep, you know, Paul said he kept the cross between him and the world in Galatians. We need to somehow every day remind ourselves of the love that was shown at the cross of Jesus Christ so that we would report to duty as ambassadors of the Lord Jesus, loving and serving the one who bled, died, and rose again for us. I can't make you do that. I can preach it till the cows come home. That's between you and God that you would love, that you would feel and experience his love. And if you have no sense in your life of living for Jesus rather than yourself, one of two things is probably true, and I love you enough to tell you. One is that you are not born again. And or, and or two, you have not died to self because self is so selfish isn't it but Paul says I want he wanted the Corinthians to know and the Holy Spirit wanted us to know because it's recorded in scripture that he was absolutely controlled by the love of Christ for him not his love for Christ but Christ's love for him I agree with MacArthur when he writes, and it was that magnanimous, free, unmerited love that controlled, drove, and motivated Paul. How can we choose to live for self when we have experienced the greatest love of all? And then finally, third, understanding God's love is the key to security. You know, some denominations preach that you can lose your salvation. I don't believe that's true at all. 
I think they get confused sometimes because I think that they see people not living right for Christ who have prayed a prayer, gotten dunked, and, and so they get confused about, well, that person's out here living like hell. Uh, he can't be saved, yet he was at one point saved. No, I, I don't believe that at all. There is security in Christ. And John 10, Jesus says that. He says in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I will give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Verse 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand and I and the father are one. And here's how those who think that you can lose your salvation, here's how they interpret this scripture. Well, you're right. No one can take you out of the father's hand, but you can jump. That's nonsense. That's utter nonsense. If someone, Judas is proof of this, who followed Jesus for three and a half years, but it was fake and phony, he never was a real follower of Christ, and he displayed that at the end of his life. Listen, I want, I want you to know something. I want you to take with you today, if you're a child of God, you have absolute security in your salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then, and then they'll say, what if, what if, pastor, they quit believing? Well, we're told in 1 Peter, 1 John, they went out from among us to make themselves manifest that they were never of us. Judas was never a genuine follower of Christ. That's why he was used of Satan. But a genuine follower of Christ is in the Father's hand. Jesus says, they're in my hand, and my hand's in the Father's hand, and my, the Father and I are one. And once they're there, once you and I are there, nothing or no one can take us out of that hand. In fact, Paul talks about this in Romans 8, verses 31 through 39. Here's what he says. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us. Amen? Amen? That's why I always tell you, if you have Christ, you've got more right than you've got wrong, and I don't even care what your wrong is. You have a greater force in you than the world can ever bring against you, right? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, right? And so Paul says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivering him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Do you know what he's saying there in verse 33? That those days when you're not living the way you should and someone wants to accuse you, whether it's Satan or the world. Notice what Paul says. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. I tell people all the time, it is not me who saved me, it was Christ. And I didn't call me to preach, he did. And if you don't like that, you need to take it up with him. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Hallelujah, amen? That we have a high priest in the heavens on the right hand of the Father interceding for us. And then verse 35, Paul says this, who will separate us from the love of Christ? That's the question, isn't it? If someone can separate, something or someone can separate us from the love of Christ, then we have no security whatsoever. Let's see how Paul answers it. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. There it is, right? Him who loved us. The greatest love of all, the agape love of God seen at the cross. Verse 38, for I am convinced, Paul said, it's been my experience, and out of my experience, I can tell you, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, 
nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah and amen. Amen? amen. Nothing. You know what nothing in the Greek is? Nothing. nothing can separate us from the love of God. Listen to me. You didn't get his love because you deserved it. So you can't lose it when you don't deserve it. God is love and he extended his love to sinners through the cross of his son Jesus Christ that those of us who would place our faith in the work of Christ on the cross and his resurrection would enter into God's family and he poured his love for us into us so that we would love one another with the agape love of God. Amen. Amen. You know, it's interesting when I go someplace and they say, where do you work? I love it when they ask me who my boss is. <laughs> Sorry, it's not you. I say God and they snap up real quick. Well, I'm a pastor. <laughs> he is my boss. <laughs> That's sobering, but he is my boss. And then they'll say, well, where do you pastor? And they'll look down and they'll say, uh, oh, a gape. And it gives me a chance to witness. It does. I'll say, no, ma'am, or no, sir, it's not a gape, it's agape. It's, that is the Greek word for the love of God. And our ministry is based on that love. Agape Family Ministries. That's, you know, my college group uh, came up with that. Agape is the love of God. Family is who we are, and ministry is what we do. So if you didn't know the history of Agape Family Ministries, that's it. Agape is the love of God. We want to operate in his love. We want to experience it, and we want others to experience it. The agape love of God. And I t I'll tell you, it is a great comfort to me to know I'm secure in his love based on what he's done for me, not what I've done to him. And give him a hand. Amen. So... How do I want to end this? Discovering God's love is the key to salvation. Letting people know that God loves them. Walking in God's love is the key to service. Understanding God's love is the key to security. And I want to end this service this morning with Paul's prayer found in Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. And this is what Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus. And I just, this is my prayer for you this morning. Let's look at it. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he, the Father, would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Look at verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love. Who's love? That's right. The agape love of God may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ, not, not head knowledge, experientially know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him, to him there's the Father, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. If I could bequeath one thing to you this morning, if I could have a gift wrapped for you this morning, it would be to experience God's love. There's nothing greater I can give you than to know, for you to know that God loves you. And that he loves you at your worst. Man, I ran from God for so long because I couldn't forgive me, let alone God forgiving me. 
But that's where you got to listen to the word of God rather than your own, the lies that your flesh tells you, the lies of, of, of the enemy. God loves me. I am his. I'm the beloved of God. And it isn't based on my worth. It's based on who he is. As 1 John tells us, God is love. And if you're in Christ, you have experienced that love. And there are times in my life when I get so busy doing stuff, I sort of push that to the side. Well, this Christmas season, I want to push it right back front and center. You're going to have gifts. You're going to do dinners. You're going to have parties. You're going to uh, experience the holiday season in whatever way you are. But I'll tell you this. Never leave sight of the cross. Be reminded of that every day. Because when you get up, you're going to make a decision each day. Who am I going to serve? God or me? And if his love doesn't motivate you, I really don't have anything for you. The greatest love of all, sorry, George and Whitney, is not our children. It's not something we conjure up on the inside of us. That's just not the way it is. The greatest love of all is God's love. When he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to die for us. To raise again for us. To love us at our worst. And then redeem us, regenerate us, make us new creations. And once we're in God's family, I'm so thankful for the security that comes with it. Nothing or no one can ever move me out of my father's hands. I believe in uh, eternal security. But I believe it for those who are really saved. Not just because you prayed a prayer or dunked your, got dunked, but that you literally each day are loving and serving Jesus Christ. Jesus said it this way, the proof of our love is obedience. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Then he went on to say in John 4, if, 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 if those that obey me are the ones that love me. So where are you at this morning? Have you experienced God's love? If you have not, and yet today is the day that God, that Christ is knocking on your heart. We're going to eat. And while all of you go through the line, I'm going to sit right up here. And there's nothing greater that could happen today than me to tell you how you can Surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Far more important than that food. Amen? Amen? I love you. This is a good day. It's a holiday, if you will. We do it every year. It's so much fun to see you and be a part of things. And so today I'm going to ask a blessing right now on the food. Then I'm going to park myself right down there. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sweetheart. If you came and didn't realize it was our dinner, you're like, oh, my gosh, I can't stay, stay because I didn't bring anything. First off, nobody knows you didn't bring anything. And secondly, it doesn't matter. We got plenty. I always ask parents to go through with your kids, right? Because kids will just slap stuff on the plate they never eat, and it's a waste. So parents, make sure your kids go through the line with you. We always start with our senior citizens. Uh, so we'll say 60 and above. Uh, and then if you brought a guest, you guys go through. I want to bless the food, our time together. And then, hey, guys, here, here's, here's something we need to understand. Contrary to public opinion, these chairs, these tables don't fold themselves up and get put away. Stay afterwards and help. Well, I got my wife and kids. She can go home. We'll give you a ride. Are you listening? Okay, so let's help. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love. God, your love has radically changed my life. The way that I see life, the way that I see people, the way that you love people through me, all because Jesus came knocked on the door of my heart, and, and, and through your power, I, I received Christ, your son. 
and you've radically changed me. I'm not perfect and won't be until the return of your son. But I love you. And most importantly, I know you love me. God, I want everyone in this building to know that love. I want them to experience the love that you and you alone can shed abroad in their hearts so that we will be the people of God that we're called to be and to serve you and to love one another. The world might take notice the love that we have for one another. I ask you to bless this food in the hands of our parent to the nourishment of our bodies. May we have a sweet, sweet time of fellowship. And God, we're so thankful for those who were able to bring something. But Father, there's plenty there for everybody. And we want everybody to stay and break bread with us and enjoy this day. I love you so very much. I pray this all in the name that is above all names, that of the Lord Jesus Christ. And amen.